Hi, I'm Dr. Sarah Hurwitz. I'm at UCLA. Uh, I'm a medical oncologist specializing in the treatment of breast cancer. Hi, my name is Tony Rivas. I'm a professor of medicine at UCLA. I'm a medical oncologist and I, I treat melanoma. So um, we've gone in 10 years from recognizing a mutation in melanoma called BRAF that's present in around 50% of metastatic cancers to having an FDA-approved drug that blocks it, uh, Demorafenib, with the commercial name of Zelboraf. But that's just the start. Uh, we now understand what we should target, how we should target it, and that the drugs are, are increasingly improved. Uh, the next step was to address resistance. Um, the, a little bit over half of the resistance mechanisms reactivate that same pathway. So blocking the pathway twice by giving a BRAF inhibitor and a MEK inhibitor, which is what the GSK has tested, uh, would make sense to get more initial responses and more durable responses. Um, it had an additional benefit that we had not anticipated, which is something that clinical testing is allowing uh, to understand basic biology, which is by blocking BRAF in non-BRAF mutant cells, we can make some of them uh, progress and, and grow and uh, these patients develop secondary uh, skin, uh, non melanoma skin cancers, or squamous cells, and that would be blocked in preclinical testing by a MEK inhibitor. And the clinical data tells us that that's right, that we can get better responses by targeting the driver oncogene and escape mechanism, and we can get less side effects by blocking uh, the, one of the mechanisms of the side effects. That's very interesting because in breast cancer and other solid malignancies, um, more and more, I think we're seeing that when you block one driver of tumorigenesis, um, it activates a backup pathway that becomes important in resistance. And so more and more we're seeing dual and even triple blockade being studied and utilized uh, to try and overcome resistance pathways. Right, some of these uh, feedback mechanisms uh, that we've learned from the literature from breast cancer, mm -hmm. from PI3 kinase inhibitors and AK18 inhibitors or mTOR inhibitors that right. you could test it. You know the pathway is on, you blocked it, and instead of going down, it actually went up. Yeah, so uh, the, the key point is to get a, uh, to have a, a MEK inhibitor that's approved by the FDA to be able to combine outside of a clinical trial. Uh, MEK inhibitors have been on clinical trials for I don't know, 10, 15 years. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's been a series of them. Now we're really getting to very powerful and less toxic MEK inhibitors, and the combinations are probably where they'll be really functional. Um, if the if the GSK uh, MEK inhibitor, which is called trametinib in, uh, in um, um, a com um, generic name, is approved. And actually, there's one of the, uh, pr um, the studies being presented at ASCO is a randomized trial of trametinib of the MEK inhibitor compared to the carbazine. And it shows meaning the, M the primary endpoints. Uh, that may be grounds for approving just the MEK inhibitor, and then it could be, com uh, could be combined with bemorafenib with, with the Roche Genentech uh, PRAF inhibitor. Uh, the BRAF inhibitors, these very selective BRAF inhibitors, are giving more or less the same results in the clinic. They have non-overlapping details in toxicities, but most of the toxicities are from a paradoxical kinase activation, and most of the effects are from blocking the pathway and not other pathways. So both bemorafenib and the uh, have more or less the same results. Um, we're doing a clinical trial with Genentech, uh, adding a Genentech MEK inhibitor to continue therapy with bemorafenib in patients who develop resistance and also to prevent resistance. So there's a series of, uh, of uh, programs that are trying to address this question and bring it uh, to patient care. And that is interesting, too, because I think, um, again, breast cancer led the way in many of these um, sort of understanding of targeted therapies. but. When I began practice six, seven years ago in oncology, um, there was no indication to continue Herceptin, trastuzumab, in HER2 positive disease beyond progression after you know a patient had been on trastuzumab and the disease progresses. And now um, more and more clinical trials are coming out showing that continuing that break on the one pathway while applying breaks on other pathways is an important way. Of, of preventing re resistance. Sorry, you're absolutely right. Because, and that's something that comes up in our uh, conversations, uh, which is uh, once we block the driver oncogene and the tumor finds a way to overcome that, if we release that 
blocking, this, the tumor goes back to what it was before. Right. If we continue it and then add something else, either local therapy for isolated uh, progression or systemic therapy, if it's progressing through uh, MAP kinase, right. then it, we, we get secondary responses. If we do it sequentially, it doesn't work. So right. we have to continue to block. So the, the example of her, uh, a trastuzumab continued therapy is, is very pertinent. Right. So anti-PD-1 is a, an antibody that modulates the, uh, the immune response. Conceptually, it's very similar to ipilimumab or the antibody that modulates CTLA-4. These are two negative regulators of immune activation. And for many years, uh, uh, in melanoma and in, in many other cancers, we've tried to turn on the immune response and we've done with vaccines, with, uh, with cytokines. And the problem is that that immune response, once we try to turn it on, it it has a whole bunch of breaks to turn itself off. Uh, two of the main breaks are CTLA-4, and CTLA-4 is an, a break on the activation uh, step, and that's what epilimumab is targeting. And then there's a late break when T cells are chronically exposed to antigen, in, like in the case of a cancer where a patient can have their immune system uh, exposed to antigen for probably years before the tumor becomes metastatic. And that PD-1 blockade then would tell us that it may be more targeted to the tumor. It's m more to the cells that are chronically exposed to the melanoma, uh, to the cancer antigens. By blocking it, now we're seeing higher response rates and less side effects than with CTLA-4 blocking antibodies, which, uh, which is great. It's, uh, 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 this, and these response rates tend to be durable because the, the immune system has a feature of memory. It remembers what it, it, it attacked. Um, the data that we'll see at ASCO is uh, it shows around a 30% response rate in, uh, in melanoma with the majority of those responses being durable and less side effects than with epilimumab. Uh, so probably it's the next step in, the, in this blockade. But it's not only melanoma. It's working in, in uh, lung cancer, around 20% responses. Uh, that's huge. Uh, you and and very, <laughs> very unusual because, you know, traditionally we think you know, immune modulation therapy should really work best or traditionally has worked best in tumors like melanoma and kidney, and kidney yeah, cancer and lymphoma. lymphoma. Yeah. Um, but we haven't seen much promising in the way of the solid tumors, the lung cancers and the breast cancers. And now I think more and more we are seeing um, interesting data being developed of, of vaccines targeted against specific tumor an antigens um, being very promising. So we've come a long way from the days of yeah. Kali, mm -hmm. and I think the work that you've been involved in is really exciting.